we are going to talk of a great Indian blindness. We are in a sort of peculiar situation in India where we are sitting on a branch and actively cutting it off while we sit on it. In our rush to grow, we are impatient with anybody who speaks about environment and conservation. There are people in the media who call them green terrorists. There are almost all of us in the middle class and upper middle class who think of them as obstructionist. And we forget that actually they are the prophets of the future. They are the soldiers protecting us from ourselves. Today, India is in grave danger of water. We are in a security crisis that will be much larger than the combined threat of Pakistan, China, Afghanistan, and you name it, combined, because we are actually drying up our lifelines. The Ganga, which feeds pretty much all of North India, and the Western Ghats, which is the tower, the water tower of the South. Ironically, the two people or who are actually protecting the Ganga and you know, for whom you might say the Ganga still exists are two Swamis who are here with us today. Swami Gyanswarup Sanand is 86 years old. And it is ironic that he is younger in his thinking, more futuristic, and protecting us for the future, a future that he may not even live to see. Swami Sanand has fasted again and again. In the last four years, he's fasted three times unto death uh, so that the government would react. And Swami Shivanand has fasted to protect Haridwar from illegal mining. To understand just how dire the situation is, I'm soon going to be calling the Swamis on stage. But before that, we have Shekhar Datatri, who started out as a wildlife filmmaker, a highly awarded wildlife filmmaker, but has increasingly turned to conservation and to advocacy because he too can see what the future is and how perilously close it is. So before we listen to the Swamis, I'd like to invite Shekhar Datatri to present to us the story of the Western Ghats. Hi. Uh, do we have audio? Yes? OK. Uh, good morning. I'm here to take you on a journey. Um, we're not going very far. If you get out of this hotel and drive for a couple of hours, you'll hit this mountain range called the Western Ghats. And for those who are not familiar with this landscape, this is a mountain range that stretches for 1,600 kilometers from the Maharashtra-Gujarat border all the way down to the tip of southern India. And it's truly a wonderland. I uh, started exploring this magical landscape when I was 16, and I still can't get enough of it. And the diversity of life is so tremendous that this area has been classified as one of the global biodiversity hotspots. And not just any hotspot, but one of the hottest of the hotspots. Uh, when we talk about wildlife, people often think about Africa. And when we talk about rainforests, people automatically think of the Amazon and South America. But to me, the Western Ghats are extremely special because we have things here that other countries and other nations don't. Uh, in South America, there are no elephants, for instance, and we have fabulous herds of elephants here. And Africa doesn't have tigers, and we do. So I'm very proud of my Western Ghats. And I can talk a lot about all the wonderful creatures you can see there, but why don't I show it to you? Um, Percy, if you can show clip number one after dimming the lights, and Ranjit, if you can put the audio, laptop audio to minus five, let's roll the first clip and wake them up. I've been filming in the Western Ghats jungles for 25 years. 
It's truly a wonderland and I watched an incredible variety of wildlife here. These forests are home to the largest population of Asian elephants in the world and one of the most important tiger populations on the planet. This is the rare wild ox called the gaur. A bull like this stands six feet at the shoulder and weighs a ton. Packs of Indian wild dogs roam these jungles. They can tear a deer apart and consume it in minutes. If you're lucky, you can see a sloth bear wandering in search of termites and ants. While I'm always thrilled to see these large animals, the Western Ghats are a treasure trove of smaller wildlife. Hundreds of species of butterflies, orchids and other wildflowers, eight inch long centipedes, snakes of many kinds, including those that eat other snakes. And my favorites, forest tortoises with their peculiar mating habits. These forests are alive with the calls of birds, but there's one sound that always surrounds you, the song of the cicada. Ladies and gentlemen, the Western Ghats. Now, a lot of people, very worryingly, a lot of people, particularly people in power, know this buzzword called biodiversity, but they have no idea why we should preserve it. They think ecology is a fancy word for bunny hugging. Well, I can give you an analogy, a simple analogy. Imagine a vast library of books, books that we haven't even begun to read, books that contain all the knowledge and wisdom we need to go forward as the human race. Well, the rainforest and the Western Ghats are this vast library, and every species in it is a book which we haven't begun to re read yet. And there are so many secrets in there, so many answers to today and tomorrow's life problems. Uh, 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 blueprints for the drugs of tomorrow to combat, uh, uh, you know, drug-resistant TB or malaria or any new viruses that might come up. Uh, this is the treasure trove that we have inherited. And as a naturalist, I don't need the forest to justify themselves, to exist. Uh, we haven't created this, we have no right to destroy it, and we couldn't recreate it in a hundred million years. Only nature can do it. But for the hard-headed people out there, there's a very, very good reason to protect biodiversity. It's not just a buzzword. Now, I wish I could tell you all that uh, all these creatures that you saw uh, lived happily ever after. Unfortunately, this is no fairy tale. Uh, the Western Ghats has been ripped apart over the years. And if I were to draw a map of the Ghats about 200 or 300 years ago, which is not very far back, uh, a tiger could conceivably have walked all the way from uh, Maharashtra to Kanyakumari in the south, 1,600 kilometers. Today, the biggest threat to the Western Ghats is that it's become fragmented, and that's the biggest threat to any habitat. Connectivity is lost. Hydro projects, roads, uh, factories, towns, villages are protected areas. Our sanctuaries and national parks have become tiny islands of green in a sea of humanity. As one of my biologist friends always says, they're like ice cubes melting in the sun. And there are so many threats to the Western Ghats, but I'm going to show you just a few to give you an idea of what we are doing to this amazing landscape. So please, could we dim the lights and put on clip number two? In summer, man-made forest fires cause immense damage in the Western Ghats. Lit by forest produce collectors, cattle graziers, and arsonists, 
vast stretches of forests and grasslands are scorched every year. Fires are particularly devastating to the fragile rainforests in the upper reaches of the Ghats because they are not adapted to withstand flames. The trees here have thin bark and little resistance to fire. A severe burn can permanently damage even a forest giant like this one. Ancient trees provide nesting cavities for endangered species like the great hornbill. When fire destroys these trees, it leads to the local extinction of many species that depend on them for nesting and shelter. Hornbills play a vital role in dispersing seeds. If they disappear, the very future of the forest will be threatened. But fire is just one of the many threats to the Western Ghats. Their systematic destruction began more than a hundred years ago when the British converted vast acres of rainforest into plantations. This tea garden may look pretty, but it's utterly lifeless. Roads too have caused immense damage. Snaking through the remotest forests and grasslands, they provide easy access for destructive activities and limitless exploitation of resources. Most of the rivers that flow from these forests have been dammed, and the resulting reservoirs have submerged vast tracts of virgin forests in the valleys. During the last decade, another devastating threat to these forests has increased. Mining. The obscene profits from the export of iron ore have resulted in the large-scale rape of the Western Ghats, turning pristine wilderness into ravaged wastelands. Not only is mining destroying forests and grasslands, the erosion and siltation during monsoons is truly shocking. On the left is the Badra River after passing through a mined area. On the right is a clear stream from an undisturbed forest. Thanks to the greed of a few, forests that have evolved for over a hundred million years are being stripped away, destroying them forever. Well, in uh, summer, stop. As uh, that's the third trip. Stop, stop, India. stop. Well, Shoma said it right when she said that we are actually cutting the branch that we are sitting on. Uh, conservation of nature is not a noble act of charity that we do towards nature. Uh, this is the biggest foolishness that the human race has. We think that we are doing something noble and wonderful by saving nature. Uh, like I said, uh, when working with government, I've found that uh, people in power, politicians, bureaucrats, uh, think of people like me as nuisance, as a really big uh, irritation, you know, right up there with death and taxes, and, uh, and mosquitoes. And forget about empathy. I mean, they, they don't care about the beautiful creatures that are uh, going down the tubes because of us, nor do they care so much about the destruction. But I believe that every politician in this country has a really good reason to go out there and become a card-carrying environmentalist and fight for these forests because these forests are keeping 400 million people alive in peninsular India. That's 40% of India's population. Shekhar just shared with us what we're doing to the Western Ghats, that is the source of 65 rivers of peninsular India. Swami Sanand and Swami Shivanand is going to tell us what we're doing to the Ganges. Before that, I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, Swami Sanand's story, more than I've said earlier. In 2008, he, because he fasted for 38 days, the Prime Minister was forced to meet him and set up the National Ganga River Basin Authority. They promised him that in three months, this was led by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. In three months, there would be a resolution of many of the issues that he raised. There was absolutely no word from them for the next six or eight months. Swamiji has fasted again and again. As I said, four times in the last three years, 
most recently in January to March, he fasted without water so that he could yet again draw attention to what we're doing to the Ganges. Swami Shivanand's uh, uh, devotee, uh, Swami Niganand, died last year, fasting 115 days, trying to stop illegal mining in Haridwar. The government did not respond till he had passed away. The media did not respond till he had passed away. Uh, as we go along, I'll tell you a little bit more about how Swami Sanand pretty much single-handedly has kept the Ganga alive. Uh, but before that, uh, Swamiji, can you share with us why did you get so involved with the Ganga? What happened? And how bad is the situation really? Well, actually, right from childhood, I was deeply believing in Indian culture where Mother Nature is uh, so marvelous that uh, the human brain can never match its creativity or its beauty. That way, Gangaji was almost not only in my brain, but in my blood. And I regarded Gangaji to be one of the great gifts of Mother Nature to India. I studied environmental sciences and uh, was that way a lover of environment as a whole. But I realized that Gangaji is unique in the world. And as uh, the films by Dattatre have just now shown, that uh, in nature, you just can't compare all the things to each other. Everything, most of the species are unique. Gangaji was so unique that we accepted her as a goddess and as mother. I think most uh, of Indian families have experienced over generations that Gangaji's waters don't deteriorate even when kept over hundreds of years. Even the invaders, Muslim rulers, have realized this property of Ganga water, and whether Akbar or Aurangzeb, they were using Ganga water. And even the Europeans realized that Ganga waters, when taken into the ships from Kol Kolkata, would not deteriorate even when they land London. But what is the situation now, particularly after independence? Gangaji has become just like a dump of our wastes and also what they call a natural resource. Resource means something to be exploited. It is this exploitation, exploitation of the water for canals, exploitation of the gradient for producing power, exploitation of the bed material for construction material and other things, exploitation, exploitation, completely degrading and destroying the vegetation in the forest and also the unique wildlife around. And it seemed to me that there has to be start somewhere. And uh, so I decided first to go by reason. I found that reason doesn't work when self-interests are involved. And according to me, the greatest problem was that today we don't try to understand what are we. Are we just the body? Or are we just what our brain can see and understand? If that was it, then there would be no end to life when life goes away. Life is not just the mind, the physical mind, or the physical body. There is something beyond it, even if people can't define and actually prove it. That is what we call Atma, and some people may call soul. And that way I felt that Gangaji is the Atma, is the soul of our culture. So, it is the identity of India, the best known identity. If somebody was to say, how do we know India, then I think one knows it by Gangaji. And I realized that it is my own identity. And at that time, I thought that I can put my whole life at stake if I could conserve Gangaji as Gangaji was. Swamiji. To see that Gangajal 
will again last for long periods, will not deteriorate. Gangaji would be the health giving, the disease destroying, the miraculous cure that it had been over centuries. And that is what made me to take up this fight. Swamiji, very often... Swami, very often a concern for the environment or for the rivers or for the, or for the ghats is seen as a kind of chivalric exercise, you know, as if one is trying to protect something against one's own self-interest. Could you talk to us about why economically the Ganga is as important and what we are doing to it? I remember Sundarlal Bahugana once said that ecology is the permanent economy of, our, of any world, actually, and certainly our country. So just in terms of what degradation of the Ganga is going on, you know, right from Bhagirathi and Alaknanda, could you share with the audience a little bit of what you saw in Alaknanda and Bhagirathi, and why did you fast uh, to protect the source rivers? Well, in today's world, we try to quantify most things, and if one has to understand to what extent when we are destroying Gangaji, then let us just take the question of the total flow of water in Gangaji at Prayag. Uh, most of you would be knowing that from January 2013, we would have the Kumbh, the 12-day festival Mahakumbh at Prayag, and something like 8 to 10 crores of people are expected to be there for the Kumbh Snan without any invitation, totally at their own cost, not the way that I have come to talk to you at the cost of somebody else. They go at their own cost, taking a lot of trouble, not traveling by plane, many of them walking with their uh, small belongings on their shoulder. And what, for what they are doing all this, these eight to 10 crores people, they are going just for a dip in Gangaji, believing that Gangaji is what it used to be. Now, if there were no canals and no disturbances by human beings, just as it had been until 1846, then Gangaji at Prayag would not have less than 500 meter cube per second of water, even in the driest period of April or May, and even in the driest year. When we measured it last year in April, it was hardly 50. It was 38, not even one-tenth of what it should have been. So more than 90% of its waters have been taken away in canals. So one thing is abstraction of water into canals. And you can see the magnitude. This is not just with Ganga, this is with Krishna, this is with Kaveri, this is with most of the rivers of India. But then Gangaji is Gangaji. If we are doing it to every other river, if we are disrespecting every other woman, should we disrespect our mother also? So for me, mother is not just a woman. And Gangaji is not just a river. Thank you, Swamiji. <laughs> Swami Sanand was better known uh, as Professor G.D. Agarwal, the legendary Professor G.D. Agarwal. He's recently uh, taken Diksha, and he has a PhD in engineering from the University of Berkeley. And as I said, it's been a war for 40 years or 50 years now uh, that Professor has been waging for the Ganga. Uh, Swami Shivanand, as I said, you know, you lost Swami Nigamand, uh, who fasted for 115 days. Do you think that sacrifice has borne any fruit? You had to go on fast barely two or three months later yourself. Has anything been gained by his sacrifice? We are not thinking of the result. We are saints. We do not know what will be the result. It is our duty that we are doing. We are saints. We left this world to Search our Atman, just like you think. If you think, who are you? Who am I? Then in this way, like you have written think, I is missing. In the same way, if you think, who am I? This I will miss. And if you search this I, there will be a symbol on the top. That is, the, this in, individual soul, is the universal soul. M Atma Brahma. This is our motto. And when we left our uh, the world, we are doing tapas in the bank of Ganga. 
we saw the deteriorating conditions of Ganga, how it is being exploited. The Ganga, whom we think as our own soul, we used to think from the very beginning of, of ourselves that when we do tapas on the bank of Ganga, it will be very easy for us to search our own Atman, and this uh, does will think that the, this individual Atman will be the universal Atman. Thus, we, with our disciple, we do tapas, and then thought that to search this individual Atman, we have to do service for the universe. And that is why we are doing this, and in this way, not only Nirmanan, we have previously lost our one cent also, Swami Gokulanand. And I am saying that Nirmananda has not died of fasting. He has been poisoned, not once, but again and again. And it is the tragedy in the country that corruption is pervaded in such a way. When we started for the purification of Ganga, to work for Ganga, we found that the main obstacle to do our duty is the corruption. Not in the society only, not in the politician only, not in the media only, but in the highest forum of judiciary. And I'm saying that Nirmanand is fighting for the purification of Ganga, and when we found that the main obstacle is coming from the honorable judges, he was sitting for the removal of two judges, but not the media, not any person, for since they are afraid of contempt of court, when mention this vital thing. This is the condition of our country. How, how can we do anything? If we have any problem, we'll approach the higher forum. From there, we'll get nothing, but if we'll say anything right, anything true, you must be ready to face the contempt of court. So this is the tragedy. So we have lost our two cents. I'm ready to lose this body too. My disciples are ready to leave this body. Swami Sanan is ready to sacrifice to save the Indian culture, the humanity, the very primble of our society. Every true Hindu wanted to have a drop of Ganga Jal when he was, or he, she was dying. And we have told many persons that it is our generation who is using this nature for ourselves. We have got this Ganga from our forefathers, and it is our duty to give this Ganga to the, our coming generations in the same way that we got from our forefathers. And for that, we are ready to sacrifice our days, ourselves. And if one, two, three, four, or hundred cents will die, then you will arise. You must have to arise. And the, the time will come. Because now we are sleeping. My two disciples have died. One disciple have died of after 115 days fasting by giving poison. Swami Sanan is ready to leave this body. We and our sons are ready to sacrifice, but you are sleeping. A time will come when you have to awake. Even media are not so conscious as they should have been. It is the tragedy of the country. We are sleeping. We have taken many things from our forefathers. Our country is great. Our religion is great. Our culture is great. You are destroying this culture. You cannot say that the government and any other person this time, it is you and you, you are sleeping, therefore government is working, therefore the corrupt persons are working, and we are dying. Wait, we'll give you hundreds and hundreds of the cents. When they will die, you must have to rise. This is our... Shekhar, both the Swamis have made a very spiritual and emotive appeal for why we must protect the nature that we have inherited. Uh, I'd just like to share some very quick facts with you about the Ganga. There are 600 dams on the Ganga. At Bhagirathi and at Alaknanda, the Ganga is reduced to 10% of its flow. 
until Professor Agarwal fasted, uh, there was a plan to tunnel the Ganga 14 kilometers from source for 150 kilometers so that there would be absolutely no river left in the original basin. In terms of corruption, uh, in terms of pollution, the Ganga today is a source of cancer. So let's forget the idea of it being a holy river. In Varanasi, where the acceptable amounts of pollution is 500 uh, MPR of coliform, we actually have 3 lakh <coughs> MPR of coliform. It is a diseased, dying Nala. And that is what they have been protecting. Before we close, uh, Shekhar, I just wanted to ask you, many people stay cold to this emotive uh, idea of protecting nature. What is the economic reasons for protecting the ghats and the, and the river, you know? Uh, and how does that play off against growth? Everyone imagines that this is obstruction to growth. Uh, can you explain the connection? Well, there can't be any growth without water. I mean, would this hotel run? Would we be sitting in there if there was no fresh water to flush our loose and have our showers? There's just no way anything would run. Industry needs water. Agriculture needs water. We need water for our sanitation and drinking water. Where is this coming from? It's coming from this wonderful source called the mountain and the forest, and no king, emperor, prime minister, or planning commission chairman can create this weather system and this water harvesting system. Only nature can do it. And we are destroying it. And I have only one... I have only one thing to say. Anybody on earth who does not fight for the environment today is an enemy of the people. So, let us not label a few people as environmentalists. All of us have to become environmentalists. Because we have a tremendous potential as the human race, oh, tremendously ingenious. We don't know where the human race can go if we don't wipe ourselves out in the next 50 years. So let's, let's work together to protect what little is left. Because nature is extremely resilient. It can be brought back to life if we just do a little bit. Swamiji, before we close, 20,000 crores has been spent on the Ganga already. Nothing has happened. There are still sewages. There is no treatment. We still have polluting industries, 5,000 pollut polluting industries on the river. What is your absolute urgent steps that you feel the government should take now? Well, while we are meeting here, probably a meeting in Delhi has already started. We, on the, when we were going, nine of us were on a fast, not even taking water for several days, when the Prime Minister said that he wants three months <coughs> in which he would be able to decide as to what needs to be done and so give me three months, that was in the end of June. And a inter-ministerial group was constituted under the chairmanship of one Dr. Chaturvedi who is a member planning commission. That group is going to have its last meeting today, that is uh, 2nd of November, and it is expected to give its report within the next few days. I don't expect much which come out of it. But uh, obviously, the scope of their decision or their term of reference is essentially on the various projects or dams that are being built in Uttarakhand. And here, if what the government is planning is almost 83% of River Bhagirathi would be either in tunnels or standing water in reservoirs. And more than 75% of Alaknandaji would have the same fate. Actually, when it comes to conservation of Gangaji, one of the most important thing is continuity, what we use, uh, aviralta. Because once you build these projects, the continuity for ecology is lost, and the piety that physically would come from the sediments and the aviral flow is destroyed, and this is something that has continuously been happening. Of course, there is a question of flow, there is a question of mining, there is a question of uh, the land under Gangaji, which is being continuously usurped. Uh, you must be reading a lot of land scambles that are going all the time, and this is also happening with the land of Gangaji. So there are all these problems. And uh, we have an agenda which had been submitted to the central government. As some of you would know, I used to be a professor, but now I am a sannyasi 
in the order of the Shankaracharya of Jyotish Peet and uh, the agenda uh, and its agenda notes that giving the details which were submitted to the government. I have a write-up on this which I will leave uh, with the organizers of this uh, forum uh, and those of you who are interested may be able to obtain that. But I would say in the end that there is hardly any hope that uh, the government is going to do it uh, with the type of limited pressures that we are able to exert. But uh, my only hope is that uh, this is not going to end with just the pressures that we can generate and ultimately the people of India would be able to preserve this unique gift of nature which is their identity, which is their soul and which is the one which has kept India and will keep India. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Swamiji, for coming here. There's a bit of irony I'd like to share with you. The day Swami Nigamanan died, the World Bank uh, sanctioned 7,000 crores for the cleaning up of the Ganga. The government and the World Bank are working in partnership on this. I don't think any meetings have really happened till then. And uh, as uh, Shivananji said, that I hope at least hearing some of this will help us waken, because otherwise they're a band of very small men uh, really battling to save what will ultimately be our own life source. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. As a closing word, I would say that we have at least 10 Nigmanans willing to follow Nigmanan. Let's endure.